So let's get these inlays seated and we're going to use a 2% chlorhexidine for two minutes on both of the preparations under rubber dam isolation. And this is going to help reduce bacterial numbers and provide a patient with more comfort after they're cemented. I like to put a little wax on the inlays and carry it to the mouth with a condenser in the same orientation from the dyes that they'll be in the mouth. So we like to try them in at first and make sure that they seat completely. It is a little difficult to remove the castings if you push them fully down. So you have to trust a little bit that your lab work is correct. So check the margins and contacts, make sure everything is okay. And then look on the inside of the castings and take a look for any rub marks. And I like to use this burr called the H48L to remove any of these little shiny spots. These are indications where the casting may be rubbing a little bit and may in some way hinder its full cementation. So after this we like to sandblast, try them in again, and sometimes you'll find they will go completely into their final resting place, in which case you may need to pop them out with an instrument. I'm going to utilize a low film thickness cement like a glass ionomer. You could also use one of the other cements like zinc phosphate or even a cement like a ceramer which have very low film thicknesses. And we tap them into position utilizing these birchwood or orangewood sticks and with a little malleting which is going to vibrate out the cement and make sure the castings get fully into position. After you get them down completely and no more excess cement comes out, you probably want to hold them in position for another 30 seconds or so. And then we're ready to start the finishing. And we'll use the medium garnet for this in a slow speed straight hand piece. I'm using a mini Moore's medium garnet in this particular case. The assistant is blowing air to keep the tooth cool and also to keep the field clean of any dust that comes off of this disc as it's working in the mouth. It's also important to make sure that the disc is spinning from gold to tooth at all times. And this means that you're going to be going back and forth between your handpiece control system, whether it be on a control unit in your bracket table area or it's on the handpiece itself, turning it from clockwise to counterclockwise many, many times during this procedure. The goal of the garnet is really simple. Get the gold and the tooth on the same plane. And this is really the goal of this medium garnet disc. It's not going to provide you with a particularly smooth surface. In fact, you'll find that it actually roughens the casting that you've received back from the laboratory. But there's really no way to avoid this uh, particular step. And I think one would consider this to be the most critical step for getting the casting and the gold on the same plane. Now, once you are finished with this disc in the straight hand piece, you're going to want to put it in the contra angle and have the grit facing distally or towards the handpiece whenever you're working on the mesial lingual. You just aren't able to get this area utilizing the straight handpiece. And once you're satisfied that you've got the tooth and the gold to the same plane in all areas, and you can check this with an explorer or you can just look at it and kind of see the difference between when you started and where you're at now. You're now ready to move on to the next disc, which is the fine sand. Now the fine sand is going to remove the scratches that you really have placed in there utilizing that first step with the medium garnet. The fine sand can be used first in the contra angle just to continue where you were with the medium garnet and then you move it into the straight hand piece to finish up the rest of the finishing and polishing. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, why in the world would you use what we know to be a laboratory handpiece in the mouth? And I think this probably comes from the tradition of doing gold foil preparations utilizing a straight handpiece many, many years ago. But what we found in the modern world of dentistry today is that the straight handpiece provides us with significant control. 
The quality of the turbine and gears in this three hand piece is excellent and it gives you a very good spin. You can feel the disc moving very precisely and I think that you'll find this will work really well for you if you give it a try. So after we're finished with the fine sand, we'll move on to the fine cuddle. And we're going to use this disc either facing towards us or away from us. First, we're going to use it in the straight hand piece. So we just continue efficiently from where we were in the previous step. And then once we have finished with the straight hand piece, uh, moving this disc around the margin area, not so much on the edge and not typically entirely on the side, but a little bit in between, you'll find that you can get a very smooth and flowing restoration morphology. And you notice that we're using the contra-angle for the mesial lingual of the uh, casting on the first premolar. And when we're satisfied with the margins, we want to go ahead and check them, make sure everything is nice and uh, smooth and we don't see any areas where we have excess enamel or excess gold, we're now ready to move on to the polishing step. The first step is to use the number four flower pumice wet in a Young's cup that fits into the contrangle. Now this cup is really special. It is a ribbed cup that does not have the webbing on the inside. In other words, it doesn't have that cross shape in the middle. It's essentially just a cup that is completely void of anything other than little ribs that go around the periphery of the internal of the cup. This keeps the polishing medium from flying around and it keeps it more in contact with the rubber cup and the tooth as we're utilizing this. And I think that it's also important to make sure you're paying attention to the direction of the spin of the cup, especially with the number four flower pumice, because it is possible if you're spinning it from tooth to gold rather than gold to tooth, you're going to find that you may dull the margin and end up getting this little reflection type of effect at the tooth gold interface. So you notice that I am going to lightly polish the gold utilizing the cup and the wet flower pumice and get into all areas. It takes a little bit of effort to do this. And once I have applied all of this pumice to the tooth where I need to get it, I'm practicing, I guess, what you would call application of the polishing medium. Then after application, we're gonna go into the evaporation portion. And for that particular step, I'll need to have the assistant now come in and utilize suction and air spray while I'm rotating very lightly. And this will create a very fine finish and a higher gloss to the surface. Some people refer to this as a shiny surface. I like to use the word lustrous or a fine finish or perhaps reflective, anything but shiny. I, I know that Dr. Tucker always hated that word. He always suggested that we uh, use that word to describe maybe a penny or something, but not uh, a casting in someone's mouth. We're spending a lot of time to create a beautiful, smooth finish that is going to be very, very smooth and protect the tooth from a lot of bacterial adhesion. So let's give it a respectful name, perhaps, like a highly lustrous or reflective or incredibly smooth finish. And this is a typical finish you get with this first step. We're now going to evolve to the next step, which is a 15 micron aluminum oxide. And once again, using this wet and rotating, if you can, with the leading edge of the cup from gold to tooth, wherever you possibly can. Sometimes it's just hard to do, but you want to try your best at getting this cup rotating in that manner. It tends to create a more painted on marginal effect when you were finished. So right now the assistant is not blowing any air. I'm applying the product without any air spray or suction at this point. In other words, this is the application step. Once again, it's a light 
pressure. We don't want to push really hard. We want to do this really carefully so as we don't generate any heat in the process. But make sure you get into every possible angle, every interproximal space. Once you're satisfied that you've applied it everywhere, then you're ready to perform the evaporation. And during this suction and blowing of the air, the cup should be moving very lightly over the surface. And you can see that the gold starts to take on a highly reflective, beautiful finish. And one might think, well, isn't that enough? I, I think it might be okay, but I would prefer to take it to the final step, which is going to provide an even smoother surface. You know, one of the things that we can do with gold that it's just nearly impossible to do with composite is we can get a highly smooth surface. Bacteria does not like gold. It is very much repelled by highly polished, beautiful gold, particularly a high gold concentration. We know this from direct filling gold procedures, in other words, gold foil procedures. So I always talk about the biocompatibility of cast gold and direct gold as being superior to any restorative material that we have. And as much as I enjoy placing composite restorations and it's part of modern dentistry, we all have to understand that composite is a very attractive surface for bacteria. Bacteria thrive around composite margins. They love the composite surface. In fact, there are some bacteria that actually can survive by just uh, utilizing the byproducts of composites. It is actually their food source. And it's sad that we don't have a better material than composite for the restoration of teeth that would be aesthetic. But oftentimes, like in this case for sure, we can place gold and hide it when the patient's smiling and render the tooth incredibly aesthetic. Rather than a cosmetic procedure that we're doing with composite or ceramic, gold is preservation of the natural beauty of tooth structure. Gold represents a truly aesthetic effort on the part of the dentist because we're not trying to hide natural or try to replicate it through an arduous process utilizing expensive laboratories or techniques that are not always predictable. We're simply saying the tooth is incredibly aesthetic. Why reinvent this? Let's utilize material that will preserve the tooth structure probably for a lifetime, will not require replacement, will last this patient 30, 40, 50 years or even longer, and not have to go through the restorative cycle of continuously removing and replacing and removing and replacing composite restorations. No matter how well they're performed, composite restorations have a much shorter lifespan than a cast gold procedure. Yes, cast gold is more expensive. There's no doubt about it. Initially, it's more expensive. But when you consider the long term of gold over the lifetime of the patient, I think you could make an argument that it is, in fact, more cost effective and healthier than options that are initially less expensive at the beginning. Many of my patients are on very strict budgets. I have a lot of patients with a very humble income and they choose gold because they don't have the resources to continuously replace alternative materials. It's an interesting situation. When I'm performing a procedure where we're going to photograph things, uh, I like to place a second rubber dam on top of the initial rubber dam. This is the double dam technique. It's really simple to do. You just uh, place another dam on top of the dam you have in position. And you may find that this is a great procedure to do when you've noticed that your rubber dam has torn during a procedure and you must maintain a dry field, for example, during a bonded procedure where it's essential not to have any contamination during the uh, procedure where you're cementing a 
a bonded ceramic restoration or you're in the middle of a composite and something tears, it's nice to know that you don't have to take off the rubber dam. You can simply put a new rubber dam on top of the other rubber dam. In other words, a double dam technique. Now I'm going to go back to the one micron, but this time I'm going to use it dry. And you notice that my dental assistant is not allowing me to place this material without the suction and air spray working together at the same time. In this way we can minimize the amount of powder that gets all over the rubber dam so that we have a nicer final photograph if this is what we're trying to do. So I think the castings uh, finished out uh, pretty nicely. Uh, they're never perfect, but I think that these are uh, in the category of uh, very nice, and hopefully they will last the patient a lifetime. That's the goal with cast gold dentistry. It's lifetime dentistry. And I hope that you enjoyed this video, this final video in this series, and stay tuned for more. Thank you.